Welcome everyone to Data Innovation Summit 2020. We have another panel here with three great guests. Please introduce yourselves. Kent? Hi, I'm Kent Graziano. I'm the Chief Technical Evangelist for Snowflake. I've been um, working in the data space for well over 30 years. Uh, got my introduction to data warehousing and analytics by working directly with the father of data warehousing, Bill Inman. Um, co-authored a, a, a book or two with him, um, also an expert in the Data Vault methodology and architecture, having co-authored the first two books on Data Vault with the inventor of that methodology, Dan Lindstedt. Um, I've been with Snowflake for a little over four and a half years now, just been having a great time uh, traveling around, around the globe, speaking to customers and industry audiences like this one, about the future of analytics in the cloud and uh, what we can do these days with all of the great technology we now have compared to what we had when I started quite a long time ago with my first little data warehouse. Cool. Mutsars? Uh, yes. Hi, my name is uh, Rick Mutsars. Uh, I'm a principal architect uh, for Informatica. Also, like uh, Kent, uh, spent uh, a better part of 25 years uh, in uh, predominantly data warehousing and analytics. Um, so, yeah, Bill Inman, uh, Dan Lindstedt, very familiar names. Data Vault methodology picking up rapidly uh, now, especially given uh, the way you can automate all of those uh, processes using AI and machine learning. So that's a, a nice segue into the, the topic of, uh, of today. I've uh, spent uh, 20 plus years on the technology with Informatica. Um, so, yeah, uh, you, you could call me a, a, a diehard Informatica fan, uh, so you will. Um, and yeah, I'm helping more, many organizations make their move to the cloud with all these new uh, shiny cloud technologies. And how do you really implement that in your organization? Uh, it's hard enough for uh, most um, most IT organizations to to keep up with uh, the technology, let alone introduce new technologies uh, like AI and ML uh, to business users. So how do you do that really? And that's what I'm trying to help organizations with. Cool. Dan? Yes. Hi, uh, Dan Sommer here with Click. Uh, so I'm compared to Rick and Kent here, sounds like I'm a little bit of a junior. I only have about 15, 20 years in, of experience in the space. Uh, so my background is essentially, uh, I spent the decade, best part of a decade at Gartner. I was the research analyst there for BI and analytics markets, i.e. where the space is heading, uh, which technologies are growing, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and then uh, I just spent five years now with my current employer, Click. Uh, this summer, it passed five years. And here I head up the market intelligence team. And I like to sum that up as kind of uh, looking at the macro, uh, i.e., are we heading in the right direction? Are we seeing the forest for the trees? The micro, uh, so things like pricing, analysis, and then competitive dynamics, i.e., the supply and the demand, what are customers looking for? So that the kind of confluence of those and is, is the team I'm heading up. Cool. Well, let's uh, zoom in a little bit before we zoom out and take the macro view. Uh, I'd like to hear all three of you what your thoughts on are, what the latest trends are from this past year in specific, and perhaps also in light of COVID-19. What kind of technology have we seen advanced in this past year? And what have we seen regressed? Uh, I think also it'd be interesting to hear in terms of customer demand, if, uh, if that matches what, what kind of technology advancements we see. Um, Kent, why don't you start it off? Sure. So we've definitely seen a, uh, a major uptick in adoption of cloud. I mean, it's, and especially with the pandemic, uh, everybody working remote, the clouds turned out to be kind of the, you know, the savior for data analytics because we didn't have to worry about having people go in and out of data centers anymore. Um, we can accelerate the, the time to value because it's so much easier to spin up um, resources on the cloud. Um, in Snowflake, we were, of course, seeing this all over the place. We've got um, an uptick in people getting into a consolidated cloud data platform, which is, is what we provide. But from a COVID perspective, we actually had a customer in, um, uh, where are they? I think they're in Hungary, Star Schema, went and collected 
from John Hopkins and the CDC and the World Health Organization, uh, Italian health agencies collected all this COVID data, put it into what uh, you know Rick and I would probably call a curated data mart. You know, did a little scrubbing, put it into a form that would be understandable by data scientists and analysts alike, and put it into a shared uh, data place on the Snowflake data marketplace. And we've had over a thousand customers access that to do augmented analytics, right? So it wasn't, it turned out it wasn't just healthcare. That's one of the things that surprised us. It wasn't just healthcare companies that wanted access to this data, retail companies, because they're trying to figure out their supply chain is like, where, where's the, where are the spikes? You know, where are we needing to anticipate certain kinds of demand, like for, you know, the PPE that the healthcare workers needed, you know, how can we get it there faster and being able to use that and that combined in, you know, using some machine learning type um, systems to start projecting and forecasting then based on what star scheme has collected from all the authorities, then take that and forecast that where, where's the next problem going to be, you know, is it going, is it going up? Is it going down? How does that impact our supply chain? Uh, financial companies are looking at these as well as retail companies and of course health healthcare and insurance providers are trying to do all of these. And so I've seen um, yeah, in the last six months, right? This confluence of data coming together in the cloud, uh, having everybody's still looking for, Rick, you'll remember this from Bill Inman, like single source of truth, right? Well, now we actually have half a chance of putting that together because we have that scale, right? Before we couldn't get servers to scale, we'd run out of room. And then the data scientists are having to pull data from 15 different places to get the story together. Well, now they can get it all in one place. And then being able to share that data on top of it, like what uh, Star Schema did. So they're, they're making all this data available. So now the organizations don't even have to go out and find the data themselves. They can just connect to it via our data marketplace. And it's a, um, it's a read-only view of the data. And now they can augment their data with this shared data and we get augmented analytics. And you start throwing things like uh, auto ML on top of that, right? And some mm. of the uh, other products that are out there now that where auto ML is starting to be getting a big thing like uh, Data Robot and Data IQ, two of our partners that people are really working with. And so you combine that with something like Informatica and Master Data Management and data quality tools that you've got in that world to get all that data into one place and then really start taking advantage of it in a, um, a much more agile manner. But like I said, the time to value is like, it's shrinking. They're able to get results, which in a pandemic like this, that's critical, right? That's mission critical now. How fast can we get this data and how fast can we drive uh, intelligent decisions and projections and forecasts from that data? And so all of this is it's coming together. It, it's you know somewhat miraculous, right? I think the timing the timing is just just right. It's serendipitous for the world that we have these technologies available that we can start really doing something with it that's significant for the global population. I suppose that's the best euphemism you can come up for, with for what's happening right now in the world. There's lots of upsides always that people are looking inwards. What do you say, Rick? Um, both both uh, things that are um, trending up and also things that are trending down. I'd be interested in hearing what you see that uh, has been... Um, Taking a back seat, so to speak. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I I think what's what's really really important now is that uh, given there's no physical distance or a physical uh, presence uh, for most uh, most people working with data, um, it's really getting the understanding of the data. What am I what am I looking at? Um, it's it's really fundamental if you want to make the right decision that you really understand the data that you're working with. There's so much data available any anywhere. Uh, whether that's in a snowflake appliance, whether that's in a public uh, data uh, data store uh, somewhere, you really need to understand what am I looking at, especially when you're feeding machine learning algorithms. I, I mean, if if you have a, a simple uh, math, then everybody can understand if you feed X is 10 and Y is 20, that the result Z is 30. But now what happens with the machine learning algorithm, you feed data into it, you, you, you teach it, you, you learn, you train it with data, and then you hope that 
at some point, uh, the model is trained well enough with good quality data that once you put in a real uh, data sample, you get a real valuable uh, output uh, out of it. And you can trust that output. I mean, if you throw in 10 and 20 and you get the result 17, yeah, there's no way to correlate that if you don't really understand the model and if you don't really understand the data that's coming in, uh, in, in into that model. Um, similar, uh, data provisioning, I can't already mention it, data provisioning is really important. Self-service is becoming even more important now, I would say, than uh, a couple of years ago. So that, that's really due to um, the, the vast amount of data, uh, the vast amount of tools available. Um, IT is overwhelmed by trying to get their heads around all this new technology. And most, you, you need, need to understand that most database administ administrators, they perfectly understand how an Oracle database works or how to optimize a Teradata appliance. But now they're moving into a Snowflake uh, appliance. How does that work? It, it's a completely different paradigm. It has so much more power. So you need to adjust your head to get around that and, and to learn how to work with, uh, with those. And, and we see organizations really struggle with um, IT organizations being overwhelmed and like, well, but my business is, is ever more demanding and they, do, they don't want to wait three months to get their data uh, approved. So uh, data provisioning uh, capabilities are also really uh, going up. Um, trending down, I, yeah, I, I don't see a lot of trends going down. I, I see demand for data and good quality data uh, going up. Um, but I, I, on the other, on the flip side, I do see that there's, um, well, because of the trend, everything is going to the cloud. The demand for on-premise uh, technology is significantly de decreasing. Um, we see that in our software sales, there's a, a complete uh, shift. Uh, from our on-premise uh, based uh, tools into our cloud-based uh, tools. They're skyrocketing. Uh, so yeah, that's a definite trend, I would say. Dan, you're the king of trends. Uh, does this extend, you know, we've, we, what we've heard now from Kent and Rick is that it's, it's a quite a tech heavy uh, kind of transformation. Does that extend into the organization or would you say that in the tech is where a lot of that uh, change is happening? So uh, yeah, I mean, first of all, I, I concur with much of what uh, what Kent and Rick is saying here. Number one, increased usage usage of SaaS. What used to be kind of linear has become reached a tipping point, and you know, organizations can't run their business when people are physically distanced. We see that self sufficiency is critical. I.e., you need to open a you can't open an instruction manual and start reading it, but you need to, it needs to be super intuitive the software. Uh, and have collaboration features built in because you can't sort of lean in together physically and do it. So that has to be very intuitive in the software. Definitely uh, increased demand for shared data, as was alluded earlier, intuitive visualizations and storytelling as everyone's an armchair epide epidemiologist right now. Mm -hmm. Staff and contractor reductions. So that means that, you know, we need to sort of a quicker time to value. Uh, is is also super important, but then there's midterm and possibly lasting effects of this as well. For example, uh, cloud budgets, um, you know, they will stay intact and grow. Uh, that's just there to stay, but you're going to see bigger sort of data migrations to the cloud and more. Um, even even the most resistant countries of the world, perhaps here in Europe, for example, you're going to see la larger hi uh, hybrid and multi-cloud transitions, and I think. Never waste a good crisis. It's sad to say, but I think many, and to your point about technology there, uh, whether technology is driving this, uh, I think many CEOs are looking at uh, the new normal after this is done, and it's not going to go back. You're going to cut down on real estate, for example. Definitely, and what we're seeing is the biggest outcome that customers are looking for is, is essentially uh, improving and redefining processes. And if you've laid off a bunch of back office people, for example, I think things like robotic process automation and process mining will cover for some of those layoffs. Uh, and that's one area where AI is increasingly being applied. Uh, uh, but the bigger sort of question mark to kind of tie to what, what Kent and, uh, and Rick said is, we need to deal with a world that is increasingly distributed. Uh, and so therefore, I think we've solved a big data problem. 
Uh, the big next problem that we have to solve is the wide data problem, where data is in multiple different places. You have to bring, bring the data to the right place. Metadata is increasingly important. And harmonizing data uh, from multiple different data sets, because that's usually where you can invent sort of the next business models, to your point about technology and, and business models. So I think there's a bunch of technological underpinnings that are happening, which is leading us to this perfect storm of a third generation of technologies and value that can be provided from it. All right. There have been a lot of uh, startups that have really um, taken the opportunity to take some of these new technologies and roll with them. And as a consequence, we've seen also a lot of mergers and acquisitions relating to these startups. Some of them come from within the companies where you know companies have their own little accelerators within the companies. And sometimes it comes from startups on the outside. Have you seen that with your customers, Kent, uh, where people have you know, relied on Snowflake to provide sort of an enterprise foundation and then incorporated some of these new uh, outside companies to build on top of that with these uh, new AI techniques and whatnot? Yeah, we're, we're, we're seeing a little bit of that. Um, it, some of the, the, like you said, a lot of startup companies actually early on with Snowflake, we had a lot of small tech companies in uh, Silicon Valley that have... Uh, then gone on to be acquired. And I've actually seen a couple of Snowflake uh, customers get acquired by Microsoft, right? Mm -hmm. And so they, they actually, Microsoft acquired a company that was successful because it was working on Snowflake and then able to take the, new, the processes and analytics that that company had developed already, sort of, I'll say like an incubator and just suck that right in. Um, mm -hmm. even, even Snowflake, we, we've acquired several small tech companies ourselves. So our, our new UI out called Snowsight came from a company called Numeracy. And that's now an app on top of Snowflake to enable our customers for self-service to, uh, to Dan's point, to make it much easier for them to analyze the data and really, again, accelerating the use of the data. And so definitely seeing um, some, of, some of that is happening for sure out there. And I think we'll see more of it, right? As uh, we start to see which of these new companies have legs, right? That that are getting adoption, and it may even be only in a particular vertical. Uh, I expect to see that sort of thing. And so, even like, well, Click. I'll use Click as an example. Um, you guys acquired Attunity this year, right? So we had that merge year where before we had, you know, a lot of thought really a lot about click is reporting. Well, now we have replicate and compose, right? And so they've, they've expanded their footprint um, by, by getting these other key technologies that are gonna help their customers achieve this goal. And so- Yeah, it's... exactly. So, so think... yeah, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but perhaps I can fill in here. So, I mean, uh, since, since you mentioned click, I mean, we've, tr we've tried to move back in the value chain. We spoke about this increasing world of distributed data. So then, there's, it's no longer enough just to do analysis. You have to do analysis and synthesis. You have to synthesize data sources that are in a bunch of different places. So we see that as the panacea, working with partners like Snowflake, Informatica, Data Robot, and many others within sort of a modern stack ecosystem, but also being able to do a lot of that end-to-end -end and, and see synergies there. Uh, essentially, um, so, so, so being able to sort of move data from raw to transform it to analytics ready, we spoke about metadata, to then uh, essentially do analysis on these, this, these distributed data sources and take action on it. That Those are sort of the steps in that value chain. But on, on the startups point, I think it's interesting to see that, yeah, I do th see a lot of mergers and acquisitions going on right now. Uh, Click, you mentioned we acquired Unity, but we also acquire a lot of companies in our ecosystem that have built on top of our open platform. So we uh, also acquired an alerting company. We acquired a company that does sort of pixel perfect reporting, et cetera, and it's integrated from day one. But we also see a lot of less viable uh, companies uh, that, that may struggle as perhaps uh, some of the investors are getting cold feet. So I do think that we'll see a lot of uh, both big and small mergers and acquisitions. Today I heard that, I'm not sure if it's true, so pardon me if it's not that Microsoft is looking at, for example, acquiring the American uh, part of TikTok. Uh, so we'll see these mega mergers as well, but we'll also uh, of, of sort of very mature startups, 
but we also see an opportunistic approach from companies acquiring really small startups where their investors may perhaps have getting a little bit of cold feet. Right. Well, I think you can, I mean, you can extend this sort of uh, concept and analogy even further. And for companies that might be working in, you know, say retail and might not be interested necessarily in uh, purchasing an IT company, that they might still be willing to make a sort of investment in a technology that a company might be developing in order to gain a technological advantage over their competition. Rick, what, what do you see in terms of those types of investments into sort of uh, groundbreaking technologies when it comes to AI? Is that something that only the big companies afford themselves or uh, where does that happen? Well, I don't have a very clear view on it, but um, it is interesting to see uh, like technology, um, like that, that's processing uh, engines like, uh, like Flink. Um, Flink is a real-time processing, data processing engine as compared to Spark, for instance. Well, we all know that Spark is the norm, but uh, it's interesting to see that a company like Alibaba then acquired Flink uh, to be part of their ecosystem, which is supposed to compete with the Amazons and the Google Clouds and the Azores. Whether they will be very successful outside of the, uh, the Asia region, I don't know. We, we hardly see them when we talk to our customers in, in, in Europe uh, predominantly. Um, uh, well, at least that's the region I'm focused on. Uh, the Americas see a lot of uptake for Amazon and Google. Um, uh, Europe is, is very strong. Uh, Microsoft is very strong in, in Europe, I would say. Google's coming up, but we, we hardly see any, any Alibaba uh, for that matter. But it is interesting to see that those large um, uh, ecosystem uh, vendors are acquiring soft Salesforce with uh, their uh, acquisition of MuleSoft. Um, uh, it, it brought them some capabilities that, that, that they needed uh, to uh, complete their platform. Um, uh, to us, um, we're, we're sometimes uh, competing against uh, MuleSoft. Um, so all of a sudden, because their Mule's uh, focus is on supporting uh, Salesforce, to us, that was a benefit because, well, we, we, we saw them a little bit fade away. Um, so yeah, it's 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 a gain for one, and it's a loss for some some someone else. So it's it's really up for up for grabs, I would say. Um, but it is interesting to see these smaller companies uh, be acquired by large um, by, by large ecosystem uh, vendors. Yeah, it, not just in your own industry. To your point, I mean that that's definitely happening since every company is now an IT company and everything's getting digitized. But we also see, like, if you're only acquiring technologies in your own segment, you're just going to be a fast follower. Uh, but if you're acquiring interesting technologies in other segments where there are perhaps similar sort of dynamics going on, I'm thinking of telco or financial services, for example, then that's even more interesting. Perhaps looking at you know the American giants would be should would do well looking at, for example, Alibaba and Tencent and these Chinese players that, that are very cross vertical and use, for example, messaging and payments. Uh, those were two separate technologies before, and now they're sort of integrating those. Uh, so I think we'll see some cross vertical um, acquisitions as well. Yeah, and we, we've certainly seen that at, at Snowflake. I mean, er, earlier this year, it was pretty well publicized. Um, Salesforce's venture arm invested in Snowflake. So to your question about them investing in a technology and uh, it was a year or so ago, um, Capital One, their venture arm invested in Snowflake as well. And so those, yeah. are, those are two that I can actually talk about that have decided you know, that they, not only are they using our technology, but they want to help ensure that it evolves and does help provide them that competitive advantage. And so they in turn have invested in the company in addition to just, you know, purchasing the software. And so that was interesting for me. I mean, a, this is the first, I'll say, big startup I've, I've worked in in my career. I've had one other startup I worked with, which was fairly small, that eventually got acquired by Oracle. Um, but this, this, is, this is much bigger, what Snowflake is doing. And to see this sort of cross-vertical investment, right? Um, and on the merger side, again, you look at Salesforce uh, acquired Tableau, um, Google acquired, uh, what was it Google got last year? Was it Looker? Looker, correct. Yeah, yeah, Looker. 
Um, so there's been a couple of those as well. There's some, I'll say, consolidation from that perspective. But you know, yeah. Salesforce buying um, technologies that are you know um, specific to, I say, helping their customers. Right? They're they're again similar to what you've done at Click with expanding the where your presence in the value stream. Salesforce is now is doing the similar things in acquiring uh, MuleSoft and um, Tableau so that they can better help their customers get the value out of their platform, out of, out of the CRM platform itself. So yeah, there's a lot of interesting things happening. And I think with, again, what's happening with the pandemic, there's some economic impacts, right? Yep. And I don't think we've seen those yet. Those are coming. I think in the, in the next six months, we'll start seeing those from a, a business perspective. Uh, we'll we'll see, and like you said, the CEOs, you know, they're having to forecast what's the new normal, right? And so there are those business use cases that um, nobody probably foresaw six months ago that CEOs and CIOs and chief data officers are all now thinking about. It's like, okay, how do we deal with this? You know, how do we make sure that as a company we we remain competitive? Um, and as a company, we have the workforce that we need and that we are still treating that workforce well, that they want to continue to work for us, that they're, um, you know, the whole attract and retain your workforce with this, you know, the, the new normal with so many people being remote. Um, how do we manage all of that? And so all of that requires data. Right. And so we're, we're, we're back to that. You know, how do we do that? How do we accelerate that? You know, yeah. and and improve the processes, you know, to, to your point earlier, Dan, right? It's, it's not, it is not just the technology. It's like we use technology as a way to improve the business process, to improve the business decisions and improve the, you know, customer and constituent outcomes is where yep. we're really trying to go. I'd like to spin back to something that, uh, that Dan was talking about before, which has to do with that. You said we're all software companies. And that's become sort of a maxim that, that people have spoken. And I'd like to hear to what degree you think that is true or not, especially when it comes to data and advanced analytics. Only one person today has, uh, has spoken in absolutes. Uh, they said that you have to be on the cloud, otherwise you're old news. And I thought that was sort of refreshing because everybody speaks in vague terms. And yeah, you need a little bit of this and a little bit of that. You guys, would you be able to commit to any sort of absolutes when it comes to these things? For example, do you have to be uh, on top of advanced analytics and AI to be relevant? Or does that only apply to certain industries nowadays? What do you say, Rick? No, I, I think that uh, that applies to any uh, any industry. Um, if, if you're not uh, implementing AI and machine learning strategies to help you make better decisions, to help you uh, build the better pipeline, data pipelines, to help you get a better understanding of your data, you're falling behind and then you're losing uh, the game, especially in this world of digital transformation. Uh, digital transformation is all about how can I get to my uh, customers faster, especially in this, in this, uh, in this new world of, uh, of, of the, uh, after the pandemic. Um, Customers realize, organizations realize, they need to retain their customers. So having that 360 degree view of their customer is critically important. Uh, being able to uh, to uh, uh, retain uh, your, your your customer by doing a next best offer, uh, by better predicting what a customer will do in in in, in its uh, uh, course, um, uh, being able to better predict when machines are going to fail so that you can lower uh, the cost. Uh, it's, it's ever more important, I would say, uh, now compared to, uh, to yesterday. So uh, it's always fun with someone who's a little bit contrarian. So it's good that we have absolutes and, and binary viewpoints. I'm going to be the one taking the other position. I do think that there are opportunities in, in, having, in, in having a leg in, in both worlds, uh, both when it comes to the data side uh, there are all kinds of regulations. You know, sometimes they're contradicting one another. So we have this mosaic or maze of different regulations in different countries, and you have to handle that. Uh, so then it's good to have optionality. Um, you know, we certainly see 
you know, GDPR and sometimes is, is perhaps even sometimes in contracts, contrast with the U.S. Cloud Act, for example, that stipulates that if your data is in, an, in a data center owned by an American company, they have the right to pull that data. So then you might need optionality, for example, having your data in a, in a private cloud or even on premises, for example. So that's, that's on the data side. And when it comes to AI, there are lots of opportunities across the spectrum there as well. You know, fun fact, I mean, there's still rep reporting companies out there with huge margins and sort of living well of uh, sort of perhaps a shrinking base, but still uh, we see uh, even companies using mainframes still and consultancies having huge amounts of, of, uh, of margins in, in delivering services for them. When it comes to AI, I mean, every company and, and, and analytics, every company has a reporting factory that churns out the reports that people need on Monday morning. I don't think that that's necessarily going away. There's a huge opportunity of sort of pulling some of those into more interactive dashboards and perhaps even sort of reporting insights before uh, you build a dashboard. And you do that through moving further back in the value chain, in the data value chain and finding insights there. So, you know, there are different ways of addressing this, this AI paradigm. Not everyone needs to address the the, the data scientists and the data science labs are doing the most advanced stuff, but you can also sort of build in a lot of under the covers type of algorithms and machine learning into, into just plain old reporting or, or, or analytic workbenches as well. So I think uh, there's a lot of goodness across the whole spectrum, both when it comes to data and when it comes to AI and analytics uh, in, in, a, in this world. Yeah, and I, I to to add to that, I I think uh, we should not forget the on-prem world either, uh, because as you, as you as you rightfully said, um, the, the the move to the cloud is not something that happens overnight. Unfortunately, for some cloud vendors who wish that were true, but we have an example of um, uh, well, it's 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 been a while back, but the the Dutch Ministry of Defense was trying to consolidate all their applications from. 14,000 to a couple of hundred. Um, it took them 10 years be before they could really switch off the first application. Moving to the cloud is complex. It's not a, it's not, so moving the data is simple. That's just a copy and paste. But all the dependent processes, all the, 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 the processes that need to be realigned, that takes a hell of a lot of time. Uh, so, and, and that's a huge investment, uh, both in time and, and as well as, as, as man hours. So let's not forget that. That's also where AI and machine learning can help. They can help uh, understand all the data pipelines, all the flows, which ones are the most important, which data has not been touched for a year so that I don't have to migrate all of that. But still the on-prem world is, is really important and uh, to, 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 to keep attention uh, to. Right, but yeah, I'm going to put you on the spot for a moment because I know that Snowflake is a big and very capable system. I mean, what, one of the things you could answer is, does every company need something that capable of processing massive amounts of data uh, in order to be relevant? Yeah, and it's interesting because there was a, a Forrester study that I quote all the time from a couple of years ago where they, they did uh, a survey and their survey came up with this number, which to me is kind of bizarre. 73% of the people they certified said they were aspiring to be data driven, which I look at the other side, that means 27% aren't, right? Or yeah. are you saying 27% already are data driven? But I said, I don't want to be working for that 27% that aren't aspiring to be data driven because regardless of cloud or on-prem, that's the competitive advantage, right? Is making good use of that data. And so to that point, uh, we just uh, saw a number earlier um, inside of Snowflake. We see really small companies taking advantage of it. And so this gets to your earlier question about us being, is everybody becoming a software company? Is everybody becoming an IT company? And I say, no, they actually don't want to do that. We need to help them get closer to their core competencies, which means being less of an IT company, less of a software company, but still a data analytics company. And so you can take uh, with, with something like Snowflake, you can have, because it scales, right? And it goes very small and you're only paying for what you use. You can start with a very small budget and a very small company that has no expertise in the infrastructure 
or like Rick and I with a zillion years of data warehousing. They don't even know what I, I, I've had customers who don't even know what a data warehouse is. Never heard of Ralph Kimball, never heard of Bill Inman. They just know they've got these log files from their website and they need to look at their customer behavior. It's all JSON data. They need to get it into a platform and start running queries on it. And the, and some of them are jumping right to what I call citizen data scientists and using things like AutoML, right? So they may go straight from zero to AutoML with JSON data in Snowflake. And it could be a very small company, but this is now allows them the time to take advantage of the data and actually grow to become a large company. And then likewise, the massive companies that are looking at, we've got petabytes of data and there is no on-prem system in the world that can handle it. We spent 10 years trying to make Hadoop do it and great, we got all the data, but we couldn't get the analytics out because it was too freaking slow. And so now we've got to get it into something more high speed. Uh, one, of our, one of our customers spent um, a couple of months loading. They had 15 years of web logs, right? All JSON data. They were loading a trillion rows a day for several months to get all that in and be able to merge it with their relational data that had been in a big on-prem system. So they took the big on-prem system and as you said, Rick, it, it took a couple of years and they got all that up into Snowflake. And then they started now backloading in 15 years of really customer behavior data from their website, web logs. And a couple of people asked me, it's like, that certainly, that must cost a lot. Well, it, it costs a fair amount of money to load that much data. But once it was loaded, then their cyber analytics team could take a look at it. And again, they're applying machine learning now to all of that data to drive uh, better outcomes for their customers because they have all of it. So it actually, it's, it's on both ends, right? We can go from the very smallest. And again, that's the beauty of yeah. the cloud is you go from the very smallest to the, 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 the largest workload you can imagine. And I do see a lot of customers taking on-prem Hadoop and on-prem databases and putting that all into Snowflake so they can get that single cloud platform now and they can make all of it accessible to the citizen data scientists, to the professional data scientists via dashboards uh, for their, their analytics within their finance department. Um, all of these use cases now start coming to life and the, the vision that I think, you know, Bill Inman and the fathers of uh, you know, industry and data warehousing back a couple decades, that vision of having that single source of truth is, is now coming true with the addition that we can now actually democratize the data. Like we, we've been talking about that, Rick, what, probably what, two decades, democratizing data, right? Yeah. And, and now we can do it. Now we can do it and it is, and it's not restricted. It is not just the Fortune 1000 that can do this now. It can be a startup that, you know, just spun up a company in Silicon Valley last week, right? They got their first website up. Well, now they can, they don't have to have a couple million dollars and a bunch of guys like me and Dan and Rick to help them do it. Right? They can, they can get going with, with the, the, uh, their, their CTO, who's also their developer and programmer and start loading that data in and, and get to it and try to beat their competition, right. And try to keep that investor interest up that Dan mentioned earlier. So the investors are going, Hey, yeah, this thing's got legs. Let's, let's keep investing in this company where if uh, one of their competitors is the, in that 27% of the Forrester survey that wasn't aspiring to be data driven, they just thought, Hey, we got, we've invented a great mousetrap here. We're going to go, you know, start a company and we're going to get it. And we're just going to be hugely successful because we built this really cool thing, but they're not really looking at the data. And that's, that's going to be the differentiator is how effective are companies in using the data that they have. And then the next piece of that is how effective are they at using other data that they don't necessarily have? Because that's been the, a vision in data warehousing for the three decades is being able to augment your analytics with external data, data that your organization doesn't have, but data that nonetheless happens. And so, you know, back to my star schema uh, COVID, you know, use case that we talked about earlier of putting all that data up there and making it available to thousands of customers companies that now don't have to go find it on their own, don't have to spend IT resources to acquire the data, cleanse the data, format the data, and then merge the data. All they got to do is plug in and start
start doing their analytics. Uh, that's a, what, what, one warning, a uh, word of warning, and I, I don't want to uh, sound patronizing, but um, uh, one, one thing that's really, really important is that even as, as, especially if you're uh, combining data from all kinds of sources across the globe, um, be uh, be vigilant in understanding uh, the data. Really know what you're yeah. looking at, beca because um, especially with with these COVID, um, there's been a huge debate on how do you count deaths. When do you count yeah. something as a COVID death? And if you if well if you don't do it right, um, you get like uh, misrepresentation. I, I think it was in the news that Mexico had a, a real odd way of counting uh, COVID deaths. So probably in reality. Um, uh, oh no, it was Iran. Sorry, it was Iran. Uh, it was today in the news uh, that they counted it wrong uh, according to international rules. And if you if you then correct it according to these international rules, they were now in the top four or top five of um, most uh, COVID deaths. Whereas if you look at the, the John Hopkins uh, data now, um, they're kind of somewhere in the middle. So it's it's really important to uh, to have that sense of what is this ad data actually mean before you start combining it yes data is, is globally available everywhere but please ensure that you understand what you're doing with the data especially with machine learning algorithms which yeah, brings us to data literacy, data literacy. Right? yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> and and i don't know if I'm, I'm one day i'm frustrated the other day i'm happy we, because we started we're all off. discussing data right now and arguing with data in my world is one of the key tenets of uh, of, of data literacy. You have to argue with the data all the time and argue with each other. But sometimes I get disillusioned because it feels like we're just sort of in our stovepipes and we're refusing to budge. And it's very rare, unfortunately, to see that people are sort of shifting positions, uh, increasingly rare. So I don't know what you guys think about that, but definitely data literacy is huge. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. And, so, yeah. For all for all those reasons, what Rick just said. Yeah. <laughs> you you yeah. got to understand I, the content. Well, I was going to say, we well, have time for one more question. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, let's end it on that note. In terms of data literacy, I'd like to hear from all three of you a short note. This past year has given people the opportunity to focus inwards and you know rethink their processes, but also we've seen a tremendous investment in um, certificates, training, and data literacy in general. Uh, when it comes to data literacy, where do you think companies should be putting their efforts? Where should be, they be looking at and upskilling themselves in, in short terms? I'd like to hear from all of you. Kent? Well, uh, what we're seeing is, of course, yeah, you have the classes and the certificates and, uh, you know, Claudia Imhoff's been talking about data literacy and critical thinking for a couple of years through TDWI and other venues. And you, you have people that are, I'll say, expert in teaching people about this, but we're seeing a lot of, um, internal communities of practice developing. I think we, you know, uh, so we used to call those centers of excellence, right, in the BI world. And so we're starting to see that. And part of that is companies are going to have to invest internally. So you, you need some coaches, right? You're going to need coaches, you need experts to teach people how to think about this properly, um, how to ask those questions, how to ask unbiased questions about the data. Um, you know, that whole bias in machine learning is, is a major issue, but you've got to have people that can guide them, but you need the internal people in the organization who understand the company's business problems and understand the data, right? That they, they know what the policies are. They also know what the politics are, but within the company and can um, kind of traverse all of that. So it's, it's, it's a little bit, it's beyond the, I'll say the typical data governance and what we think of as data literacy. I mean, it, it all is kind of coming together. You need the coaches just like we did in agile, right? We had scrum masters, right. To help keep the teams on track. You're going to need somebody like that from a data literacy perspective to help guide the organization, but you're going to need the internal people to become experts on enacting those policies and those processes and uh, putting together those, I'll, I'll say for lack of a better word, data catalogs. So people understand that, you know, how, how was this number derived? What's the right way to think about that number in context of all the other data we have, in context of our business, of our actual business, in context of our customers, in context of all the regulatory privacy and compliance that we have to deal with, right? What do you use? What don't you use? When do you use it? 
When don't you use it? What needs to be obfuscated? What needs to be masked? Um, who gets to see what? And what happens if some of the data necessary for understanding the context is actually uh, private data that you can't show to someone else? Now, there, there's a whole other ball game, right? It's how do you give them the context if you legally can't give them the context? Yep. 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 That's why I, I go ahead. Uh, I, I think um, um, I, I fully agree with uh, with Ken, by the way, and I, I think one of the one of the key things that companies uh, need to invest on, uh, apart from everything that that Ken said, is uh, building up this catalog of uh, of knowledge. And whether you do that in Excel, it's probably not the best tool uh, to to do that, or whether you buy um, uh, something like the Enter Enterprise uh, Data Catalog from Informatica. I, I don't really care as long, well, I do care, but as long as you start to invest in some piece of technology that will help you gather that wisdom of the crowd, uh, because everybody has a little bit of knowledge in their heads around the data that you use on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, but wouldn't it be nice if you can bring all of that together in a, a centralized catalog where everybody can go and look for uh, data and find ratings based on the, on their peers? What did my peers think of this data? Um, this data was rubbish because uh, the, 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 the key elements of this data set were empty or were of bad quality. I don't uh, I don't want to use this data. I, I I, I refer to another uh, data set that I, uh, I, I'm going to use for my uh, analysis. So really collecting all of that, uh, that, that uh, wisdom of the crowd, I, I, I like to call it, that's, I think, really key. And that's what you need to start to uh, invest on so that everybody can benefit. And you really need to do that in, in, in some kind of tooling uh, to, uh, to, to cater for the scale of data that you have. Yeah, I'd like to tie it to both what uh, what Kent and uh, and Rick said here. Number one, um, you know, we spoke about cultural challenges. Uh, Gartner did a survey with CDOs, and apparently, you know, cultural challenges to accept change is the number one roadblock for them to to drive a more data uh, driven organization, followed by poor data literacy. And it's kind of ironic because none of those have anything to do with data. Uh, it's it's much bigger than data. It has to do with culture uh, and people. So I think, you know, changing the culture is super important, like you said, and you really do that through um, kind of right sizing data literacy for the right people. So you do have your what I call activists in an organization. Those are your application developers. Those are your data scientists, your architects, et cetera. You know, you should enable those people to have some sort of a driver's license or what I call a culture of desilification. They can go in and break things and, and take data from different places uh, in a trusted fashion uh, and essentially you know, drive innovation with the knowledge that they have. And once they do that, you celebrate them and you shine a light on these activists because they really are changing things with data. If you shine a light on the sort of the best and the brightest data people in your organization, then you are driving a, a, a culture where data is important. And following that, data literacy, to, to, to Rick's point here, uh, super important is essentially this notion of democratizing it uh, to, to more people. Uh, and you do that through putting data literacy programs in place, putting assessments and, and seeing where people are uh, and what they, need, what they can improve on. And, and if you shine a light on the activists, many people want to become like them. Uh, so uh, that's that's increasingly important. So I, I completely concur with this fact. This fact that don't just focus on the most skilled people in the organization, but mm -hmm. teach the basics uh, also to sort of the other 75 or 90 percent in the organization that that are you know they just want to have a data point to sort of do the go and go about and do their business. They're not really data people per se. So that's super yeah. important as well together with just encouraging exploration, doubt and questions, as we spoke about earlier, arguing with data, because critical thinking and bias busting is perhaps the most important thing that you can have. Those are three really excellent answers to the question of how to skill up your organization now in 2020. The future, future is uncertain, but I think what's certain is what you need to be preparing and investing in now to give yourself the most opportunities moving forward, and that's in analytics and advanced analytics and AI. All right, thank you three for your time today. It's been a really interesting panel. Audience, I hope you took a lot of notes. 
and I will be seeing you in the next session.